Hey, this is Jason Lytle, uh, also granddaddy, and uh, you're listening to and watching Time to Connect. Hey, Jason Lytle, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to connect. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for thanks for asking and having me. You bet, man. Uh, it's a real honor to have you. I've been a, a big fan for a lot of years. A lot of years, in fact. Uh, uh, I know uh, Department of Disappearance is now 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And maybe even more scary than that, in about six months, the Granddaddy Record someday will be 20 years old. Yeah, yeah, crazy. I just, I, I thought I was, <clears throat> yeah, I, I just, I just recently had to do this with Software Slump, the album that was before that. And, uh, yeah. and <laughs> hopefully it doesn't turn into too regular of a thing because <laughs> if you end up like swimming in nostalgia and having to dig up all the stuff in old tubs and all the archiving and all the dredging up, you know, old rarities and B-sides, but we're, I'm actually in the process right now of making a pretty cool uh, box set with all kinds of extra extra interesting material to go along with it for that for that beautiful. anniversary beautiful and will it be on vinyl uh yes sir I, I wasn't planning on asking you about this but since we brought a vinyl one of the things I, I love still listening to records on vinyl um not so much from a audiophile point of view but just because it it makes you more of a participant it slows you down you know, it's it's more difficult, and uh, you know, I have to I have to sit in my chair and and turn turn records over and put the needle down, and I I I like that aspect of of it, and so I'm glad that vinyl is kind of coming back. But do you think we've reached an era that, for the most part, vinyl is kind of gone and CDs are gone, and it's just all going to be streaming now? Uh, I have a. I have a slightly controversial take on the vinyl thing too, because I've, I've been preaching for about 10 years now. It seemed like there was this phase that we went through where I think it, everyone was trying to react so strongly against CDs and they're like, all right, CDs are out. It's all about streaming. And, um, and, and it's like, you know, vinyl's back and vinyl was the end all and vinyl is just like, there, there was a snobbery that was sort of, that was sort of surrounding vinyl, and it was really bugging me because I actually had to take part in a lot of, you know, listening and a being, and 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 uh, you know, getting test pressings, and and it was just like more often than not, the quality was actually was qual the quality was inferior. Mm. And, and I also understood that, you know, audio at its best was when, you know, there was all these amazing studios and everybody had these specific roles, you know, the engineers, assistant engineers, and, and you know, the mastering engineers and producers and second engineers and, and you name it. And, and everyone was really good at their jobs and it was all being recorded to super high quality analog and it would never see the the it would never see any sort of like you know digitization mm -hmm. at all if that's even a word uh <laughs> but um yeah and it got it got pressed from you know the one inch masters or whatever the analog masters on you know and shipped to the vinyl uh pressing plant and and at that you know those albums you know that was like the height of like you know, uh, audio. And I think that was probably existed somewhere in the early eighties, late, late seventies where like, it couldn't get any better. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden we had this new phase that came around where everyone got really, really dogmatic and really preachy about vinyl. And it was all these, and it was all, you know, vinyl that was being pressed and, and a lot of these plants that, that kind of were inferior sounding to begin with, but it was being taken from like 16 bit dats and just God knows, you know, what the recording medium and, and probably recorded, you know, on laptops. So it was just, I just couldn't, I couldn't get in with the whole. Yeah. I just, I had to be really quiet about it because, because I do get, 
you know, I, I get, I get the, the fondness and, and the n- nostalgia and like the, the physical mm-hmm. aspect of vinyl, but it, it just more often than not, like the quality wasn't there. Yeah. And I found myself actually going back. I had a vehicle at the time that still played, that had a CD player in it. And I was just like, I don't care what anybody says. This sounds amazing. It was like yeah. a lot of the recordings I was listening to actually sounded way better on CD. Yeah. Uh, I still got plenty of CDs over here. So I'm not, yeah, getting, I, not getting rid I'm of them. Hoping, I'm really hoping they come back. And I've, and I've heard murmurings. I know people that work at, um, in some of the larger, you know, and, you know, people who buy and, and sell stuff online, but also work for Amoeba and they buy stuff for Amoeba records. And, and I've heard, I've heard little things that, that CDs might end up coming back. And I sure hope so, because I have, I have a, <laughs> I have a ton of them in my garage that are still like in packages and yeah. I'd love to get rid of them actually not. And I've been hauling them around for years now and hopefully not for nothing. Yeah, I, I hear you, man. So I definitely want to talk to you about your your music um, and in all its various forms and your songwriting and whatever you have coming up, et cetera. But can we can we start with just a little bit of personal history? You're um, you grew up in Modesto, California. Is that right? Yeah, a little farming community. Um, it's not so much that anymore, but it's kind of a I often refer to it as the Midwest of California. It's it's uh, anybody especially when I'm talking to people, you know, overseas, anyone who's not familiar with California or maybe is and only knows it for, you know, the Bay Area or Southern California, it's kind of a, it's sort of a arm, it's the armpit of the state and not a lot of, it just doesn't get the attention that the other the places, especially on the coast get. Yeah. Yeah. What were you like as a kid? Um, I... I think I was pretty, just pretty. No, I was. I was the. I was this the youngest of four kids, and um, I was just kind of. I. I don't feel like I really remember anything except for my mom noticed that I was. I really liked to draw, and I really kind of liked to get inside my own head. And she noticed an aptitude for music when I was, you know, four or five banging on pans and stuff. And eventually they bought me drumsticks and a drum pad. So, and I had a record collection that was, that I had access to because of my older brothers and sisters. And I used to spend a lot of time listening, having no problem going, going in my head, you know, and everything was in the living room. So the family would be watching TV and kind of, there'd all be this sort of like chaos going on. And I had no problem just kind of going into my own little world, whether it be drawing or listening to music. And then, and then my folks got divorced and everything kind of blew up. And I think I went even deeper into myself and, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and tried to create this, my own little bit of continuity or my safe place, you know, regardless of like, you know, all the shuffling around and moving and kind of the mayhem that comes along with that when, when you're just a little kid and you're, you want some sort of uh, routine and regimen. And I, I, I got really into listening to music and kind of, and once I started hanging out with my friends, I realized that it was a little bit more than just a, a, than a slight fascination. Like I, I was really into studying, you know, studying what it was that I was listening to and eventually wondering, you know, how these sounds were made. Right on. Uh, and you, you, you've always seemed to me to be a guy, you know, obviously I don't know you, but outside looking in, you seem like a guy who has no problem being by himself. You, alone time's fine with you? Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually, I, I kind of, it's it's necessary for me. Yeah. And, but but it, it became, there's been periods in my life where it's become a bit of a problem. Um, and I had to, I have to kind of force myself to be around people because I've, and it's only... <laughs> like I, I only started to really, really get that message in my forties, how crucial it was, you know, community and to, and to, to rely on others and to, uh, and I can't, you know, I can't pull it all off, you know, on my own. And I actually find myself leaning on people or, 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 or really benefiting from and enjoying being in the company of people more so than, um, and I, all those years in the band, you know, where we were just all these guys and lots of people scrunched together, you know, for so long. I think that kind of messed me up 
a little bit too. Like uh, that made me want to be alone even more. <laughs> and I had, to, I had to come back around and realize that I do need people and I do appreciate having people around me. Right on. And, and does that realization have anything to do with you moving back to the West Coast from Montana? I don't know how isolated you were in Montana, but. Um, I, I mean, I, I went there primarily just to live. Like Modesto is pretty bleak um, in terms of terrain and, um, and you know, ha having access to, you know, quality sort of like untainted outdoors. So I, that was the wildness and the ro remoteness that I would have access to living in Montana was what I was after. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I, I made tons of great friends while I was there. It's not like I was hiding away in a cabin or something. All right. Right. And, and obviously nature is something really important to you. Um, biking, hiking, camping, still doing a lot of that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost become a problem because I'm, it's, I have so much fun. I get so much enjoyment out of living that life that it's hard for me to justify sitting in front of a screen and, and twiddling knobs and which, which is kind of what's required, uh, to make albums these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey man, speaking of, uh, of hiking, I have to share a story with you that I think you'll appreciate. Yep. I'm, I'm an older dad. Um, I'm, I'm 66 and I've got a 12 year old and, and also a 20, two-year-old and um so years ago my family and i were hiking in big bend national park have you been to big bend no i haven't but I'm no, aware. It's, it's it's amazing but we, i've got my wife and i and we've got some little ones and we're hiking on a trail we kind of we're kind of pretty back pretty far and up comes walking towards an older man by himself and i had this t-shirt on by the way yeah <laughs> It's, it's seen its better days, but yeah. uh, I wore it today. That's our, that's, that's our famous cease and desist uh, t-shirt. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, he, as he passed by me, he winked at me. He looked at the kids and he said, ain't it great being a granddad? <laughs> he just thought I was, you know, advertising the fact that it's yeah. like, these are my grandkids. Yeah. He, he had no clue, but I secretly enjoyed that. This is yeah. a cease. What do you mean the cease and desist shirt? Yeah, we, the, we, that was, that was one of our, that was one of our, uh, more beloved designs over the years. And, and, uh, it's just, we just never gave it a second thought, you know, creating that design. And then, uh, just out of the blue, we just, we got a, we got a letter from John Deere saying, ah. you need to, Wow. Well, now I'm really cherishing this shirt, man. <laughs> that, that is great. And, yeah. and this sort of mechanical looking deer. Yeah. I, I don't know what's behind it, but I do sense that you, you have kind of a complicated relationship with nature versus technology or nature and technology. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's always been fascinating to me, the way the two rub together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, it's funny. It's, I, I, you know, over the years wondering where that came from, you know, and I've, I'm sure like depending on the day and the mood and whatever stories happen to, you know, uh, pop into my head, you know, the stories kind of change or the theories, you know, shift or whatever. But one thing I do remember is I, when I was six or seven, we lived way out in the country. Like my dad and my stepmom had rented this house and it was the middle, middle of these peach orchards. We had no neighbors. And that was when, that was a very crucial time developmentally, you know, in terms of music for me. Cause my dad had just married my stepmom and my stepmom had worked for this radio station and the station shut down. So everybody pilfered, every, everyone took, you know, just, you know, whatever, say like, you know, four DJs and everybody kind of split, you know, you know, these are my, where well, I'm taking these albums, you take those albums, blah, blah, blah. So when I inherited a new stepmom, I inherited this amazing record collection too. And we live way out in the country. We didn't have a TV. And it was basically like all there was to do was for me once again, you know, to sit around and draw and listen to music and study these albums and not have anyone, you know, send me in any direction. I could just like discover it on my own and kind of decided what I liked. But um, it was living in that house. And also what I did a lot of was I would just, I would wander like, you know, for hours. We had a couple dogs and I would just like take off. And it was fine for me to do that out there. It was, 
it was completely safe and but all there was was orchards and vineyards and and you know dirt roads and stuff and and I remember I just I don't know what made me remember this memory but so out there in that kind of setting as you can imagine there was always off in the distance there was like there was either there was some heavy machinery or like harvesters mm. like you know or, or or like you know uh, caterpillars and then always be like these like kind of like mechanical sounding mm -hmm. you know machinery kind of clanking and making mm -hmm. this sort of almost spooky like just like way off in the distance yeah. and then me as a little kid you know with my imagination running wild just you know it, just playing in the trees and probably playing army man and hanging out with my dogs and just you know catching bugs and stuff and I was I was like man I wonder I wonder if there's something there you know because it was really it was really kind of ethereal and spooky and but it was also just like it was just like a normal part of my existence and and yeah. uh, so who knows you know yeah interesting really interesting well let, let's talk about uh, for a minute about department of disappearance it is 10 years old now um and I pulled up a quote you said uh if there were any deliberate attempts on this record, it was trying to get back to more of a fairy tale-ish fantasy thing that was once again rooted in reality with drums, pianos, and real instruments. Um, and yeah, I, I think it does have a maybe a little more organic feel than some of the other stuff. And you're definitely telling stories. Um, what are your what are you some of your main memories about making that record and what you were trying to do there? Well, I. I knew we were going to talk, be talking about it a little bit, so I, I had to. I looked at the track listing again, just just really quick before we talked. And the one thing that I did notice is there's there's three songs, particularly like I was I was married at the time, and the marriage was it had become clear that it was over, mm -hmm. but it wasn't over. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a matter of just kind of handling the logistics, and which I mean, fortunately for me, it, all that was fine. It, it turned out you know amicable and and pretty easy but it was heartbreaking just you know for all the years that went into it but um there's three songs in particular there's Matterhorn and there's a um Last Problem of the Alps and uh there's another one they're basically they're they're songs about uh, it's weather and it's like it's like rough inclement cold blizzardy weather that's sort of driving driving this person away it's like it, there's this division like I'm, I'm not able to reach this person anymore because of somehow they're like stuck up on some rocks or like or or there's that ended up being a theme that i kept coming back to on that album. deliberate what's that was that deliberate um i mean i'm always a fan of trying to sing about typical things in in a not so cliche manner right. you know right. right just getting getting creative with it and but i just somehow i just kept coming back to you know a storm and a blizzard and mm. <laughs> just mm. not being able to reach somebody because i literally wasn't able to reach this person we had just like yeah. it had gotten to that point you know so that was i don't know that was an easy metaphor for me to keep falling back on yeah. um but uh but yeah i don't know it's um uh usually making albums are a complete blur for me and and it's it's fun and it's sort of and it's terrible yeah. and it's it's yeah because yeah. you want it to be really good and, and and in order for it to be really good you kind of have to you get it uh you gotta really go to this other place and and then coming back from that other place that the transition from being in that place and getting back to reality and and attempting to go grocery shopping or even like go to the post office is just like you know it's 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 uh it's not always easy <laughs> yeah 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 i was talking to tim rutilli recently and he said man writing songs is just so painful you know because they they just they haunt you every you know you try to go to the grocery store and they're just you know they're messing with you and 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 man i i know that feeling well it is a cool record do you look back on it fondly can i oh, say yes. one thing really quick please, though please. One, of, one of my favorite metaphors though is like you know those crime shows where like you know like have you ever seen the first 48 or or there's shows basically where 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 a uh you know say like a a murder happens and there's these detectives and they have like a 
they have a finite amount of time to to solve the case and it's like like you cannot sleep until right it's it's basically it's just like I'm, you're trying to solve a case yeah and and you there's no resting yeah like, and it's, especially once you it's like all right here we go we're going in it's like we're not messing around anymore we're going in and this thing's happening yeah. like you cannot rest until it's done so that's 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 how i think about it a lot and that's why it's not always a fun place to or a fun process to right <laughs> anyway well, sorry well sorry to jump all the way already to another record but if that's the case i i guess the software slump must have been a really painful long experience for you because didn't you didn't you go in and out and record for a while? And then I think I've heard you say something like, then you go crazy and then you leave for a while and you come back until you go crazy and then you leave for a while. Is that, is that all that true? Yeah. I mean, that, that one, that one is hard to, hard to, uh, it's hard for me to remember. I mean, it's, I, I was just kind of on another plane back then. And I think it, I mean, that shouldn't be underestimated. There, there's a certain magic. There's a certain power that's happening when you're, when you're when you're that young and you're that driven and you and you feel like you have a lot to prove and i felt all of those things and it's almost it's almost embarrassing to me to admit how sort of competitive i am but and it's not so much it's almost like friendly competition you know i had all these bands that i really looked up to and i'm listening to all their albums and i'm just like man how can i it's just like like i i think i can i think i think i can get in there somehow but like i just but I'm not going to do it by like trying to emulate or copy anybody right. either. But it's just, but I think it, by that point, granddaddy had remained in Modesto long enough to where we, we had finally started to create our own unique thing as a result of hunkering down and staying in Modesto and not moving to some, you know, other happening spot or whatever. So it was just, for me, it's always been a matter of trying to reflect what that is and who we are and where we're from and which has always been kind of, you know, you know, sort of pretty, but sort of twisted, sort of, uh, you know, aspiring to the grand, but, but still, but still just living in the humble, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that, that definitely rings true with your music. You, you, you have, I'm sorry, that it's probably going to sound cliche or something, but you really have a recognizable sound, you know, um, uh, you, you know, even, whether it's Granddaddy solo stuff or even Admiral Radley kind of, it, it just seems like that's Jason Lytle. And, and I wonder, it may be a goofy question, but how did your sound develop? If you have a, if you do in fact have a Jason Lytle sound, how do you think that developed? Where, where did that come from? Is it just happened naturally or is there, was there some I mean, intentionality I, there? I had my favorite bands, you know, I, I have a feeling it was just like, I have a feeling I was just listening and listening and listening for for years and years and years and years and years and not even like wasn't listening to like to learn how to write songs you know i i i don't even think i even attempted to write you know you know i wasn't like i got a late start on all this stuff so there was or just you know i don't know up until my mid-20s i'm just listening to music just for the sake of enjoyment and just for the sake of and and i'm talking you know li studiously listening from the time I was like, you know, six years old mm -hmm. you know, in headphones and mm -hmm. like wondering already at that young age, wondering why like certain, certain productions are affecting me, mm -hmm. you know? And it's also just like, how come I can be moved by the energy of like, you know, uh, jailhouse rock by Elvis. And then, and then in a different way, be moved by like Eleanor Rigby, yeah. you know, by the Beatles. And yeah. then, and then you discover Pink Floyd and your just mind blows up. And then, and then you still, you listen to some really kind of like uh, some heartfelt sparse country song and you're like, yeah. oh my God, and that affects me just, just as much. It's like, what is going on here? So it's like, I think a part of my brain just mechanically wanted to first start taking that apart. And then, and then once I started taking things apart, like we like want, I just like, all right, I, I want in on this. Like, how can I, you know, and that's, was That's this? You know, it was. I'm sorry to interrupt. Was this before your ACL and your decision that skate, skateboarding is not going to be it, and you're going to have to do music, or you're going to do music? Yeah. Well, I had, I had been playing drums in some punk rock bands uh, uh -huh. like around the time that I was skateboarding, and then once skateboarding took hold, then everything kind of went by the wayside. 
And then once the big skateboarding injury happened, I had this strange, you know, three to six month period where I was just like, I was literally, you know, I put all my eggs in one basket and, and, and I was having, I was having withdrawals and nightmares and I was, and then I was just going, I need, I need another plan. Like, like what, what am I going to do here? So how old were you at that time? I was 19. Ah, okay. I didn't realize it was that late. Okay. okay. Yeah. 19, 19 then. Yeah. And then uh, it was, and then I started working a series of, of jobs, probably 19 until my mid twenties. And in that period, I was, I kind of made the decision to start. I was just like, I don't know. I'd, I'd entertained a number of different things, you know, anything from becoming a firefighter to, to, to a park ranger to, to, you know, just going to some trade school and, you know, maybe doing like air conditioning or just something like that. I was trying to get my dad off my back too. He was just like, he just wanted me to do something. He's just stay out of jail. He was, I don't care. Just like stay out of jail. Um, Cause I was kind of getting in trouble too. And I think I sort of was, it was, I was, it was clear that I was a little bit lost, but um I had worked just enough crappy jobs to where I knew I was, I was going to turn into a really miserable person if I didn't do something that I was really passionate about. So mm -hmm. I, I decided once again to put all my eggs in one basket and do it with the music thing. And I started slowly buying uh, gear um, right around the time where it started becoming a little bit more, you know, accessible, you know, simple, you know, simple stuff, you know, SM57 here, you know, Yamaha four track there, you know, a couple, you know, you know, effects rack here, a preamp there, and then slowly building things up. And then I think I started to feel guilty that I wasn't, that I hadn't gone to college or anything like that. So I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to really take myself to school. So then, then I think somewhere around, uh, somewhere around the mid twenties, I was just like, uh, all right, I'm gonna learn how to write songs. I'm gonna learn how to do recordings. I'm just going to like, I'm going all in. And I had this one job that I worked for for two years at this hazardous waste uh, wastewater treatment facility and I and I got some pretty decent pay and all that was went towards like I saved up a bunch of money to where I could live for about a year and then I just was buying equipment socking away you know buying guitars and keyboards and stuff like that I just heard one of your songs and I can't remember the treating water yeah uh, Hewlett, Hewlett's daughter Hewlett, I make yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that came from that job <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah right on uh, oh man, time is getting fa uh, going fast here, and I've got a ton of questions. I won't get to all of them, but uh, I'm rambling too. I'll try to be concise. No, no, please, it's great. Um, let, before, so I don't forget. Let's talk about what what are you working on now? What what do you have coming up? Um, I heard. Did I hear right that you're doing a, a kind of a country record? Um, or you were thinking about doing a country record? Okay, here's a here's a quick answer to that. I. I had a vision of a certain genre of music that I've never heard before. And I kind of, and this was about six years ago, I was on a road trip and I haven't been able to make the record just due to all these other things that keep popping up. But I've, I've finally, I'm about 70% done with it right now. And it, but it started off as this idea of, 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 uh, of, of kind of like, on one end, it was like it's like really slow waltzy bluegrass, with very simple lyrics, and very pretty sounding. And then on the other end, there's like very dense uh, synthesizers and this futuristic element to it, and electronics. That and, would be new. And it and but somehow it's like it's making it made perfect sense to me this uh, what it would sound like. And so from the bluegrass. And from the new wave, um, I'm calling it blue wave, but it's spelled B L U W A V, and um, and nice. it, but it's also morphed into it's it's gotten. I kind of let it. I kind of I I plan on it being a lot simpler, but I just can't help it. I'm just it's it's becoming more colorful, but I think that I think the essence of that is still there. So that's cool. that's what I'm currently working on. Okay, and and anything with the banquet project anything you have coming up with that or was that kind of a one-off thing no, you know i i got 
uh, Eric uh, from Midlake contacted me about six months ago, and I think he was trying to gauge interest. Okay. And I told him that I'm just that I personally am too busy. To, like I think he wanted to resurrect the original lineup. Yeah. I told him I couldn't, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that's discouraged him from going okay. another route or not. Okay. Um, so let me hit you with some kind of rapid fire questions, if that's okay. Uh -oh. and, and you can ramble if you want to, or, but you can just give kind of quick, quick answers too, if you'd like to. So, um, you know, you are a guy who can make a record all by yourself without a doubt, play all the instruments and produce it and record it and mix it. And, but you also have collaborate, collaborated with a bunch of really fun people. Hal Gell, you know, Aaron Espinosa, M. Ward, uh, Sparkle Horses, Mark Linkus, you had some, something there and you produced a Band of Horses record. And, and was there some Elliott Smith connection as well? Maybe you just toured with him or something. Yeah, I just yeah. toured and, yeah. and became like, you know, kind of loose friends for a little bit. Who's someone who you've never collaborated with that that you would you could imagine enjoying collaborating with? Someone who's around today playing that you say, yeah, I think I could see collaborating with him or her. Um, hmm. I can't. It's okay if you don't think of anyone. Well, about about ten years, I I, I really wanted. To, I really wished I could have. I I would love to see what me making a record and having it produced by Chad Blake would would sound like. Like I'm uh, so I don't know if that's collaborating, but and, and I know yeah. and he well he's very much he's very involved musically with his productions and his mixing. So so I I would I would love to have an album mixed by Chad Blake. I think that would be. I, yeah. And and who this is a goofy question, but I think it's kind of fun. If you could bring anyone back from the dead and just you know for a few hours you sit and and play music with them and hang out with them, who would it be? Um, uh, Lennon would be cool. Yeah, I, I, for some reason I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, that would be a pretty good answer. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think if you, I think he'd be a lot of. I think he'd have a great attitude, and it was like he, yeah, yeah. The process. What, what about Bob Dylan? What is what has Bob meant to you? I know that could be a really long answer, but maybe no, 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 no. I've I've always kind of struggled with it, like, and I had a joke there for a while. It's just like it's like I don't I don't like him, and I don't not like him. Yeah, he's he's like this, but every time I every time. I get into a situation where where I just have like perfect example. I uh, um, there was some birthday release that they did, and uh, oh, some magazine I think Uncut or somebody they did a birthday. I think it was Uncut. It was a big birthday celebration. It was a you know it was a it was a it was a compilation, and they asked me to be on it, and I was just like, Ugh. you know, it's like obviously I know a ton of Bob Dylan songs. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of them are in passing, but every now and then I'll sit down and I'll study one and it'll blow my mind. Yeah. And, and I'll just be like, I don't even know if I could go here. Cause it's just like, it's, it would be such a commitment, but eventually I narrowed it down to this one song. And it was only because I was moving into this new house and I had it on like a, you know, like a public radio station and they played the song. And I don't even know if it was him doing it or maybe his voice was just different enough but the lyrics were like killing me. The lyrics were like so good. And, uh, and it turned out to be one of his songs. So when they asked me to do that compilation, um, I did a cover of that song. What song is it? Ah, damn it. I knew you were going to ask that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's okay. It's, well, that's, uh, most, uh, most of the time. Oh, okay. I most of the time. I don't think I know that one. Uh, but yeah, it's endless, man. When you really, dig in there uh as you said a lot of them you're definitely not going to like it all but there's so many good songs i mean oh, tonight yeah, i'll right. be tonight i'll be staying here with you is one that i've been kind of into lately damn um but it's 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 the, that part of it is very intimidating to me like yeah it's like do i need another big rabbit hole in my life or? right 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 okay let me hit you with a few more questions and and i'm, I'm respectful of your time i don't want to keep you too much longer it's, it. it's it's uh it's it's most of the time check that song out okay. the lyrics on the crushing right on uh what pisses you off 
Um, just hurtful, ignorant people that 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 have no intention of ever changing or evolving from that state. Mm -hmm. And do you have specific practices to to deal with? kind of bullshit we have to deal with do you meditate or or is it just music or or yeah mine is mine is more of the i i actually i require more strenuous outdoor activity than a lot of people that i know mm -hmm. like i actually i enter like these i enter like endurance events wow. and stuff. so wow. i do a lot of tra training for those things yeah and that burns off a lot of that energy of me sure. wanting to kill people when i'm out yeah. and about <laughs> yeah how old how old are you i'm 53 yeah still holding up pretty well with doing those endurance things yeah well i have to like i i really watched my i really got my diet dialed in um yeah. i know a lot about it, nutrition there's all the ways that you fuel yourself and take care yeah. of yourself and yeah. those things i it's just like it's i spent a lot of time kind of researching all that stuff so it matters it matters i'm you know like i said i'm in well into my 60s now and it's uh this body doesn't last forever well what uh Three more questions. What do you? What are you most proud of? Uh, most proud of. Mm. Let's see. I I am proud of how I've handled myself in this career career uh this line of work that i've chosen and um somehow i learned somehow i knew instinctually early on that it was about the long game and it was about it was it was there's all these really sketchy shady things that are presented to you or and the and it's usually these outside forces are trying to convince you that you should do this and do that and if you're not really kind of keyed in to hearing your own voice and 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 kind of knowing when your gut is just going mm -mm. like you, like this person's gonna fade away this this is gonna all this stuff is gonna just like mm -hmm. it's just it's gonna be you know a memory if even that um and i think that i just i think i kind of knew on a deeper level that that it was uh it's just you know and i think there's even quotes you know about it of just like half the trick is just like sticking around and 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 actually and doing it with some integrity and it's because even i remember when i was a little kid being in, in the in the bookstore and, the, and reading the, the magazines and like this band that you loved and made like these incredible like two records and you just like you just got to a point where you, you knew eventually they're going to lose the plot yeah. and everyone there's going to be all this infighting and they're going to have to like they were going to scramble and have to, you know, add all these gospel choirs to it and, and wait, <laughs> no, no. but they, they would just be like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, pandering. Yeah. yeah. And just, and, and then, then they would just like disappear and go away. So I was just like, it would, it would be way more fascinating just to like still keep, yeah. even, if, even if there was like big gaps between it, you know, just yeah. like, keep the content, you know, high quality and, and filled with passion and, and fueled by the right reasons. And, uh, and just, and like, not, not hurt anybody in the process, not, you know, not, not, not get used to doing shady deals and just, you know, screwing people over. So I think, I think I've done all right in that regard. Yeah, man, that's a, I love that answer. That's really good. And it rings true for sure. Uh, okay, big question coming at you. What do you think happens when we die? I am I am more fascinated by by hearing that it's it's the ultimate it's the ultimate unknown and it is the ultimate unknown for a reason. Mm -hmm. I have no like i have no predictions i like and i think it's meant to be a mystery yeah and i think that mystery is like what what ideally should keep everyone mm -hmm. in line <laughs> well-mannered 
and looking after each other and, and trying to do the best they can. What drives me a little insane is, is these religions that, that lean a little bit too heavy on like, all right, this, this life is nothing because right, the right. life is just going to be glorious and magical and, and everything is going to be amazing. It's just like, well, that's it's what sad. if it's not? It's going to be a bummer that you, that yeah, you, that really you blown, blown your chance, you know, yeah. now. I feel like I feel like this is it. There's no dress rehearsal. Yeah. Like this is yeah. this is this is good. Let's just like make the best of it. Amen. And if it's not, cool. But you know, for the time being. All right. Well, last question. With that in mind, when you are dead and gone and we're we're at your funeral, what do you hope people say about you? Mm. I honestly don't care if they don't say anything <laughs> like i really don't care I, I i really don't care because that's that's me trying to that's me trying to exert power over the situation and it's like i have i have i'm powerless i have i can't like i'm like yeah whatever, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen it's like fair, this, fair enough, fair, fair yeah, enough. Anything, it's 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 whatever it is will be a result of the life that i lived yeah and, and who who i affected so uh yeah whatever it is i deserve it <laughs> well and and i think you from in my mind you sort of answered that when i asked you what you're most proud of i think that's one of the things people will be talking about is that this was a guy who endured for a long time and he he didn't give in to a lot of the things that a lot of people did and he was he kept his integrity and kept making great music and for that reason man we're still listening to you and waiting for the next thing that you're going to put out and Jason, it's been a pleasure. I really, really appreciate you taking this time to connect and, and talk with me. And uh, I wish you all the best. Yeah, thanks. It's been a joy. Right on, man. Thank you.